first, number one, why we're looking for that. I believe that uh, Megan and Sister Calton are also celebrating long home, the anniversary time. I think it's about 60 plus years. Amen, amen. 63 years. Amen. My, my, my. Amen. Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he has said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So ends the reading of the word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated in the sanctuary. I want to talk to us this morning in the form of a question. Who moved the stone? They said amongst themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? of the tomb of the grave who moved the stone. Thank you, ushers and nurses. If you will pardon me, because of the generation I came up in, for having a reflective moment, I'm reminded of a singing group, an English rock band from London, England, that was called the Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones was a band back in the day. Had as a lead singer a man by the name of Mick Jagger. I believe he also played a harmonica. Some of y'all remember because you're old like me. <laughs> the Rolling Stones. I think they've done a thing, something about I can't get no 
satisfaction. I knew some of y'all were going to get it in a minute because even though you want to act like you're still young, the truth is you come up when I came up and you remember, amen, that song. Some of y'all wanted to start singing it. I could feel it in, in the atmosphere. I can't get no satisfaction. Pardon me for having a reflective moment. Because as I think about the words of the text and the rolling stone, my mind goes back to a soul band group of brothers called the Temptation. One of their fame songs was something like this, Papa. <laughs> I don't know why you old people want to act like you know you from the hip hop generation. Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. Don't y'all make me start singing up in here. Because I feel a little something, something, but I ain't going to do it. Yield not to temptation. Uh, but I'm also reminded this morning of a miracle connected to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that deals with a rolling stone. And this subject, my brothers and sisters, I believe is worthy of investigation. In the previous series of sermons that related more so to Good Friday, that I have preached over the last several weeks. Good Friday, the day that Christ died, I have discussed with us the reason for the cross. I have discussed with us the necessity of the cross. I sought to help us to understand something about the person on the middle cross or the center cross. And then I shared with us some things about the message of the cross. But today I want to raise a question. And the question is, who moved the stone? Can you ask somebody on your road, do you know who it was? Because the question that comes in verses 3 and 4 that was presented by the women on their way to the sepulchre, yeah. on their way to the grave, on their way to the tomb. In verse 3, they raised the question of who shall roll us away the stone from the door. When they looked, they saw that the stone was what? Rolled away. And not only was it rolled away, Mark adds this little commentary and says, for it was a very great. It was a big stone. It was a large stone. It was a humongous stone. It was a gigantic stone. This was not just some little, you understand, flick of the finger, move it out of the way kind of rock. The women were asking themselves, uh, what are we going to do about the stone? This text unfolds for us several points worthy of consideration. And I wish the time would allow for me to be able to deal with them more explicitly than I'm going to do today simply because of time. Amen. I understand y'all want to get to your thing, your, your Easter meals. I understand that. And so I'm not going to keep you here to 2 o'clock. I'm just going to give you just, you understand, a little bullet point outline of what the text helps us to see and to visualize. First of all, when I looked at the text, I said to myself, I see the devotion of the women for their Lord. 
He really is a man of Sunday morning. And because they had to hurry up and bury Jesus on Friday, they didn't get a chance to really dress him as he really deserved. Because the Sabbath was approaching and they, they needed more time to really, you understand, get him ready in a proper way. So what they concluded was, we'll get him buried, but we'll come back and finish up what we should have done from Jump Street. And so when I look at the text, I'm excited about the devotion of the women that they would want to pick up where they left off in serving and worshiping and honoring their God. Or if I could stick a pin right there, would to God that we had more people like these women who are willing to demonstrate a kind of devotion that says, even though I couldn't do it then, I'm going to do it as soon as I can. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to do it today. I'm not going to put off any longer any further because he's worthy of what I'm getting ready to do. And so we've got the devotion of the women, but not just the devotion of the women. When we look at the text, we hear the discussion of the women about the tomb. They're not just walking along with their heads hung down, you understand, all quiet and serene. The real truth is the text tells us that there is a conversation that is going on. And here is, here is the nature of the conversation. We're on our way to handle up on our business, but hold on just a minute. I remember that there's a big rock at the front of the grave. There's a big stone now. We're going to do what we're going to do. We're going to do what we can do. We're going to do what we're capable of doing. We're going to do what's in our hearts. But there's something that we're not able to do. So who's going to roll the stone away? Right. Help me, Lord Jesus. That's a good discussion that's going on on the road to the sepulchre. But if we look further into the text, as I said, I can't really deal with them like I want. But let me just talk about the discovery of the women at the tomb. Yeah. There is the devotion that we see. There is the discussion that's going on only to lead us to a discovery. And what is the discovery? That the question we are raising is already answered. We want to know who's going to roll the stone away. But when they get there, they discover that what they are worried about, God done already worked it out. Oh, I wish I could stick a pin right there. And let somebody know that sometimes the stuff you are concerned about and worried about, God has already worked it out. You just got to wait on the amen, the fulfillment of it, the realization of it. You got to wait till you can see it. But before you can see it, God done already settled it. I wish I just had one somebody who could touch your neighbor and say, sometime what we're worried about, God done already worked it out. And so when you see the discovery of the women at the tomb, that the stone has already been rolled away. That leads me then to the disappearance of Jesus from the tomb. Because when they discover that the tomb is open, when they discover that the stone is removed, is gone, has, has, has now left it a man for a point of entry, they discover that the Lord ain't up in there. So that brings us to the disappearance of Jesus from the tomb. And from there, we deal with the details concerning the things that were present in the tomb. Notice Jesus is missing, but there's some things that are not missing. What is it that's not missing? The grave clothes are not missing. The Bible said that when they got in there, the napkin that was around his head was neatly folded and laid to the side. The Bible says when they got in there, the clothes that he had on were also laid to the side. He was gone, but the evidence of his death and burial and resurrection was still in the tomb. Isn't that good news that when the Lord does something, he does it with sure amazement. He leaves some evidence behind, but the evidence that's left behind, amen, does not, 
does not hinder the thought of his resurrection. It, it complements the fact that he has risen from the dead. On today, my brothers and sisters, I want to move from just being a preacher pastor to becoming a defense attorney. I'm a defense attorney for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because there are too many people who are claiming it didn't happen. I don't believe it. It's not possible. There's got to be something wrong, something funny, something about this that just ain't right. So today, I am the defense attorney for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come on, come on. I want to call somebody to the witness stand. Come on, come on, come on. And the one I want to call to the witness stand, first of all, is a silent witness. Can somebody help me right here and say there's going to be a silent witness. I know you're trying to figure out already how in the world is a silent witness going to help us to believe in the resurrection. The witness I'm going to bring is not the women who were on their way to the sepulchre. If you didn't forget in verse number 8, the Bible says that the women neither said anything to any man, for they were afraid. I'm not going to ask them to be a witness right now because they were silent witnesses after they left the grave. Yeah. But the silent witness I want to bring is not a person but a thing. I want to bring to the witness stand the stone that was over the entrance of the grave of Jesus. If only the stone could talk. If only the stone could audibly say something, amen, if only like an animated cartoon, it could tell us something we could hear with our own ears. Y'all done seen cartoons, haven't you? Where they make everything talk, chairs talk, amen, sponges talk, amen, cans talk, milk bottles talk. You know, they got everything talking now. Animals talk, but I just believe that the stone is a silent witness because the stone knows what nobody else knows who rolled the stone away. If I could bring the stone up and put the stone on the witness stand, I just wonder what would the stone say to us if the stone had the ability to articulate some things in the king's English. I want to bring the stone because I believe that the stone is an infallible witness. It's not just a silent witness, but an infallible witness. You know, we do not know much about the stone. But one thing we do know is that the stone would tell us if it could talk that I could not sleep on the job. Help me, Lord Jesus. I know you didn't catch that one, so let me help you out. People who sleep on the job don't know what happened. But because the stone is an inanimate object and incapable of sleeping, if it could talk, it could tell you how it got moved. And so it is today there are people who can't tell you what happened in church because they're sleeping while church going on. Ask them what did the preacher talk about? I don't know. Because they're sleeping while preaching is going on. What song did the choir sing? I don't know. Because they're sleeping while singing is going on. But the stone would tell us I'm an infallible witness because it's impossible for me to sleep on the job. I'm an infallible witness because of who put me in front of the grave. In other words, the people who put me here gave me a purpose. They gave me a job. They gave me an assignment. And so if anybody who can be a credible witness, I can be one. Because I can't let the people down who put me here in the first place. They put me here to guard the tomb. They put me here to cover the tomb, to block the tomb, to make sure no funny business went on. 
If you read Matthew chapter 27 beginning at verse number 62 down to verse number 66, the Bible will tell you that the chief priests, the Pharisees and Pilate are responsible for the placement of the rock in front of the tomb. The Bible says, so they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing it with a stone and setting a watch. That's not talking about a watch on your wrist. That simply means is that the chief priests, the Pharisees, and Pilate ordered that a rock would be put in front of the rock of ages. That another rock would block the door to those who would want to go in and steal the body of the rock of our salvation. There was a rock in front of a rock and a, a rock around our rock. But uh, the Bible says uh, that they even put guards there to make sure that nobody would steal the body of Jesus. Because he said, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up again in three days. They didn't want nobody taking the body and then making folk believe he rose again. But the stone that was at the door would testify that it was not any funny business going on because I'm obligated to make sure that nobody got in who wasn't supposed to get in. Why would the stone lie? Sometimes when you got people on the witness stand, they have a reason for fabrication. They have a reason for, you understand, making stuff seem a little bit more or less than what it really was. But if the stone could testify, why would the stone lie about how it got moved? In other words, I declare that the stone makes for a credible witness that Jesus rose from the grave. And I am a witness to his resurrection. My question was, are is who moved the stone? So let me call some other potential witnesses to the stand very quickly. Joseph of Arimathea, did you move the stone? You're the one who begged for the body of Jesus. You're the one who put him in your new tomb that you had reserved for yourself. You already prepared for yourself. Did you take Jesus from the grave? Pilate would, I'm sorry, Joseph would say that no, I had no reason to relocate the body of the Savior. Plus, bear in mind that I am a Jew. And as a Jew, I couldn't work on Saturday. I couldn't work on the Sabbath day. He died on Friday. And you buried him early on Friday because the Sabbath day was starting at 6 o'clock on Friday evening and moving over into Saturday at 6 o'clock. So I couldn't move the body. We had to hurry up and bury it because that means as a Jew I was breaking the law of the Sabbath. So I'm going to testify that I did not move the stone away. Have I got a witness? Bear in mind, I did not move the stone because you had guards a standing watch. And I would have had to convince them somehow or another to do or against what Pilate and what the chief priests and the Pharisees had already put in place. So no, I didn't move the stone. Let me ask the women who were at the tomb, did y'all move the stone? They said, no, remember we were talking about the stone on the way to the cemetery. We were talking about the stone on the way to the place where y'all laid him. But we realized that the rock that was in front of the door was too much for three women. Even if we all put our hands on it together, we were not enough in our feeble.
people's ability to move the stone. That's why we were asking the question that's in the record, who will move the stone for us? So we're just going to go on and tell you uh, it was too heavy for us. But can I get somebody to touch your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, what's too heavy for you is not too heavy for the Lord. What's too much for you is not too much for the Lord. What's too big for you is not too big for God. The women said we didn't have nothing to do with it. We were trying to figure out, but God already worked it out. Let me ask the disciples, can y'all hurry up and come to the stand? I want to ask y'all, did you move the stone? And the disciples will tell us, we didn't come down here in the middle of the night to, to try to move the stone. Remember there are guards around the tomb. And remember Pilate has sealed the tomb. And remember we are hiding from fear of the Jews ever since Christ was crucified. So no, we didn't move the stone from the door. Let me ask the gods who were standing watch. Did y'all do something to move the stone? Did y'all put y'all hands on it? You were supposed to keep it closed, but did you somehow or another open it up because of your curiosity? And the gods would tell you we did not move the stone. Have I got a witness here? But there's one thing we will tell you. We were bribed by the priests. We were bribed by the Pharisees. We were bribed to tell people that the disciples came and took the binding of Jesus. That's Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. They said we were asleep, and they know that's a problem right there, because any guard who's on the job, any guard that's on duty, ain't got no business sleeping on the job. He knows the court marshal is on the way. He knows a firing squad is on the way. But they took the money and lied on the disciples, saying that they took the body of Jesus. I'm going to do something here. And I hope don't nobody get upset with me. But let me call Jesus to the witness stand and I'm not going to ask you Lord to raise your right hand and put another one on the Bible because we know you always tell the truth I just want to know Jesus did you move the stone if Jesus could say something right here I believe Jesus was saying I had the power considering the miracle I already performed before I died, but nobody has ever asked me that question before, whether or not I moved the stone. Can I tell you something here, that sometimes people assume it's an outside job when there is a break-in, but the real truth is it could have been an inside job because Jesus was breaking out. Have I got a witness here? Nobody ever asked the Lord, did you move the stone? He was able to open blinded eyes. He was able to unstop deaf ears. He was able to make lame men walk. He was able to feed a multitude. He was able to turn water into wine. He was able to walk on the water. He was able to talk to the winds and the waves and say, peace be still. But nobody ever asked the Lord, are you the one that moved the 
Stone was just an inside job and not an outside job. And I got a witness here since I had the power to raise up, since I had the power to take life back again. You know, I had the power to roll the storm away from on the inside. I believe I'll call somebody else to the witness stand. I'm going to call God the Father. I'm going to call the Creator. I'm going to call the Sovereign One. I'm going to call Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to call the one who created everything and can do anything but fail and ask the Father can you move the stone I believe Matthew says in chapter 28 and verse number 2 there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know right now that God is guilty because the Bible said he sent an angel and the angel rolled back the stone. But why was the stone moved in the first place? I'm getting ready to close here because some of y'all wondering how much longer is he going to preach? I am the defense attorney. I got to represent my client to the best of my ability. Why was the stone moved from the grave? It was not moved so Jesus could get out. Can I get somebody here to touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, Jesus was able to get out without the stone being moved. Do you have any evidence to support what you just said? Just wait a few days and while the disciples are in the upper room locked away from fear of the Jews, the Bible said that Jesus appeared in the midst of them. He didn't knock on the door and say, let me in. He didn't ring a doorbell and wait on somebody to come open the door. He just appeared right in their midst. So God is able in his spiritual body to get out without the moving of the stone. But you haven't answered the question, Reverend. Why was the stone moved? It was moved so that the women, it was moved so Peter and John could get in to the tomb to see for themselves what the man said. He is not here, but he has risen. Just as he said, look right here. Here's his grave clothes, but he ain't up in here. Can y'all help me right here? Do you remember a time when a bill collector called your house and your children answered the phone and you told them, tell them I ain't here when you know you was in the house somewhere. Come on, don't act funny with me here. Some of y'all act like you ain't never rang from a bill collector. Lord have mercy on rain from a Jehovah Witness who was knocking on your door and you told the children, tell them we ain't here, that you were there all the time. But when Jesus got up that morning, he got out of there. He was not there when the women came to the tomb. He was not there. Until Peter got there, and when Peter the 
younger man went in behind him to discover that the Lord is no longer in here. I'm through right now, but I gotta ask you a question. How will you respond to the cross on Golgotha? And how will you respond to an empty grave? Have I got a witness here? There were two other men crucified on Friday. Two other men right there in the same place. The place of the skull where Jesus died. One on the left hand, one on the right hand. Have I got a witness here? They were there at the same time. They were there in the same place. They were there on the same day. And even though they had those three things in common, what they didn't have in common was their response to the cross. Have I got a witness here? One man looked at Jesus on the cross and refused to accept the Savior. But the other man on the right hand is one. Have I got a witness here? Who repented of his sins? One man accepted the Lord, but another man rejected the Lord. One man humbled himself, but the other man hardened his heart. One man wanted forgiveness, but the other man wanted freedom. One man went to paradise, but the other man went somewhere. Maybe he burst hell right open, but one thing I know, two men at the same time, with the same opportunity, but they didn't exercise the same option. I want to ask you today, based on the news you got from Jerusalem, eyewitness news earlier this morning, based on the news and the evidence presented here today, I want to ask you, how will you respond to the cross at Calvary? to an empty grave. Have I got a witness here? You gonna even make a wrong decision or you gonna make the right decision. When you look at the cross, there's blood everywhere. Have I got a witness here? It's blood from an innocent man. When you look at the grave, it's an empty tomb because the stone have been rolled away. When you read a little further, you see the resurrected Christ who proved his, his resurrection by an infallible witness. He shows himself over and over again. The Bible says he came to his own, but his own uh, did not receive him. But to as many as received him, he gave them power to become the Son of God. Even those that believe on his name, can I get somebody to touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, he came and somebody rejected him. But he also came and somebody received him. And I'm one of the ones that received him. And because I received him, he gave me power to become what I could become without his help. I am a child of God. Is there anybody here? shame to let somebody know that I am a child of God. Can you help me reach right here and say, neighbor, I'm not all that I ought to be, but thank the Lord, I'm not everything I used to be.
greater. You are convinced about the love of Jesus. And you're willing to acknowledge your position.